credits, so technically you, know, you can drop one and keep the other and so forth. Unlike in anatomy, you know how it's four credits, lecture and lab all together. Again, I didn't design that, but that's I, it's a little confusing. But anyhow, um, it doesn't always happen that lecture and lab coincide, but it does for the first couple of labs. So this is a review for you guys about the, um, the way that human organism is organized, starting from the simplest to the smallest level of organization that we know of and getting up to our, our most complicated level. So we start out with atoms, of course, and I guess we could probably break them apart into little subatomic particles, right? The leptons and quarks, but you can't really break an atom apart by any kind of chemical means. You need to have a particle accelerator so they smack against each other and then break apart. But they, we consider to be the smallest and simplest level of organization. Atoms come together to form molecules. So for example, well, tell me, what are some examples of molecules that you know are in our body? H2O. Yes. Good, you took my cue. <laughs> yeah, water, right? Water is like huge. I mean, we are made of a lot of water. It's in our blood. It's in our, our cells. It's outside of our cells and tissue fluid. It's like, we would be nothing without water. So we have two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen, right? So two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom bonded together to form H2O. So atoms form molecules. We actually have even larger molecules, too. We're going to talk about at the end of chapter two. We have carbohydrates like glucose. Those are our sugars. We have proteins. Those are big molecules, too. Um, we have lipids. And we have DNA and RNA, which are nucleic acids. All of these molecules are made up of atoms. The molecules combine in an organized way to form cells. So of those, Molecules that I just talked about, those four big macromolecules, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, which ones do you find in the cell? Okay, do you find lipids in the cell? Fats? No? Really? What's that membrane that goes around the cell that holds it all together? phospholipid, right? It's a phospholipid bilayer. So that's lipid. Cells consist of fats. What about proteins? Okay, so we think about it. Okay, we've got ribosomes inside cells, right? Those little organelles. They, they make protein, but they are protein also. So we have proteins inside cells. In terms of glucose, carbohydrates and whatnot, we have sugars in there. We gotta have some sugar inside the cells. That's how we get some energy, right? And nucleic acids, do we have those in cells? Yes, because we got DNA in the nucleus, right? Generally in most cells. We also have RNA. So most cells have all of these macromolecules. And of course they have water in the cytoplasm. So molecules come together to form these cells. And cells are the simplest level of organization considered to be alive. Nothing smaller than a cell is alive. Not a molecule of water, not fats, not lipids, none of that, not carbon or oxygen or hydrogen, not atoms, but all of these come together to form a cell. That's alive. The cell then, multiple cells, sometimes of the same type, sometimes of different types, come together to form tissues. So for example, we have epithelial cells that come together to form epithelial tissues. We have cardiac muscle cells come together to form cardiac muscle tissue. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about in the last part of chapter one. Chapter two, we're gonna be looking at the atomic level and the molecular level chapters three and six. We're gonna get more into the cells. And then finally, we say tissues come together to form organs. So we can have, you know, our, what are our four primary types of tissues? Okay, well, skeletal is a type of what tissue? Smooth is, it, is the same type of tissue. What is it? 
you got skeletal, smooth, and cardiac what tissue? Muscle. Muscle. Right, so we have muscle tissues. We have what other kind of tissue? Epithelial. Epithelial. We have what? Nervous, Nervous and connective, right, connective tissue. So those are the types of tissues that we have. And when you look at it, tissues, they come together to form organs. Look at the heart. The heart is made up of a lot of cardiac muscle tissue. The fibrous skeleton that's in, that's in there, right, that forms the valves and all that, what kind of tissue is that? What was it? I'll say it, it's okay. No, no, no. It has muscle tissue, but it's cardiac. The other type of tissue it has, the other type of tissue it has, okay, the valves, what it's made up of, lots of collagen. What kind of tissue has collagen associated with it? There's three, three other types. We have nervous, epithelial, connective, right? Which one of those has collagen like epithelial. it? Epithelial. Yeah. Not that. Two other choices. What are the other two choices? <laughs> Connective, right. Connective tissue has like has a lot of collagen in there. Okay, so that's going to help form the valve. So heart, heart, which is an organ, has cardiac muscle tissue, has connective tissue. Does it have nervous tissue associated with it? Absolutely, you hope. I mean, because otherwise, how's it going to beat? <laughs> right? You can't, you can't beat. You, you, you got to have some kind of nervous stimulation to make the muscle contract and relax. So yeah, you got nervous tissue in there. So we got muscle tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue. I don't know, I, yeah, we actually do have some epithelial tissue associated too. Because surrounding the heart, we have serous membranes. You know, serous membranes are made of epithelial tissues. Remember serous membranes? They make water and they help to cushion the heart when it beats and helps to diminish frictional forces and stuff as it beats inside the chest. You guys remember that? the visceral and parietal pericardium. Does that ring a bell? Ding, ding. Okay, so tissues form organs and organs form organ systems. So again, we're talking about the heart. The heart and the blood vessels form the cardiovascular system as an example. And all these different organ systems are gonna make up the organism, which is of course the most complex level of organization. So once again, we have atoms, smallest level of organization, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all that, that make molecules. They bond together to form molecules like water, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. These molecules are gonna be found making up the cell, which is the simplest level of organization considered to be alive. Cells of different types will make up tissues. The four major tissues that we're gonna be talking about now, epithelial, muscle, nervous, and connective. These tissues are going to make up our organs. So multiple types of tissues make up these organs as we just described in the heart. These organs um, come together to form organ systems. Um, digestive system consists of a bunch of different organs, right? We have that whole alimentary canal, but we also had accessory organs like the pancreas and the liver and all that, right? Um, and then finally, all these organ systems come together to form the organism. Okay, so any questions about that? All right, so let's start out the first type of tissue, muscle tissue, which of course is specialized for contraction, and there are three types. We have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Which of these is voluntary? Skeletal. Skeletal moves the skeleton, and we can control that. Cardiac muscle is pretty much involuntary, although if we really, really wanted to, I suppose we could control how quickly our heart beats, right? If we, for example, think of something that makes us really angry, we can elevate our heart rate, right? We can. Um, or we can relax ourselves and lower our heart rate too, but in general, cardiac muscle is involuntarily controlled. Smooth muscle also is involuntarily controlled. And you find smooth muscle in pretty much the walls of any kind of organ 
that has a lumen. What's a lumen? It's basically a space through which, right, through which things go through. So like the digestive tract has smooth muscle. It has a lumen through which food goes. We have blood vessels that have a lumen through which the blood goes through. And so the, the blood vessels have smooth muscle, digestive tract, the respiratory organs, right? A lot of those have smooth muscle as well. So they help to contract. So how, how do these tissues look? Well, skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle is the striated muscle tissue. In other words, it has these stripes which are vertically oriented. Um, what makes these striations? What'd you learn in the skeletal system? When you talk, you're talking about the muscular system and you, you talked about these little, these little structures in there in anatomy to help the muscle contract. What are those called? Boy, we got a lot of dusting to do. Cobwebs. I think it's the morning cobwebs. <laughs> this is a woman who is very honest. Now, have you heard of sarcomeres before? Oh. Actin, myosin. I think you guys probably heard this before. But it's that alternating light and dark banding pat pattern that it, 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 it is caused by the actin and myosin and the sarcomere. That's why we have these striations. Now, skeletal muscle cells are very big. You, you can see them. I mean, you could see if you looked at the cat, some of you guys didn't look at the cat, but you can actually, I mean, you see the muscle tissue there. The cells are long. They are aligned parallel to each other. They have multiple nuclei within the cell that are arranged out on the side because you have so much actin and myosin here in the middle that there's not really room for the nucleus. Now, why do you have multiple nuclei? Because when the skeletal muscle cells are developing in the embryonic stages, there are little cells which are called myoblasts, embryonic myoblasts, and they fuse together to form these long cells. And each one of those little cells maintains its nucleus, which is why, which is why you see multiple nuclei on here. Now, the fact that these fibers are arranged in parallel means that they can be individually controlled. And that's good because with skeletal muscle, which you know we can control, um, we need to be able to smoothly do things, right? So sometimes you need a lot of power, sometimes you don't. I mean, if you lift up a 50 pound weight versus a pencil, can you imagine if you had as many muscle fibers contracting lifting up a little pencil as you would lifting up a 50 pound weight, you'd hit yourself in the head probably, right? You don't need that kind of power. So because the cells are arranged parallel to each other, they can be individually controlled so that you can produce a smooth movement um, that you're only using the fibers that you need, the number of fibers that you need. So that's skeletal muscle. Um, cardiac muscle tissue in some respects looks a little similar to skeletal muscle um, in the sense that it is striated, although the striations are a little harder and smaller, to, they're more difficult to see. Um, the myocardial cells are shorter. A lot of times they have just one nucleus and the one real distinctive feature about cardiac muscle tissue are these dark lines. What are these called? intercalated discs. What's special about those? They have little tiny pores at them which are called gap junctions that allow for ions which are little charged particles like Na plus sodium or potassium K plus. Allows these things to flow from cell to cell very very rapidly. The other distinctive feature about cardiac muscle tissue is it's highly branched. Okay it's not the cells aren't arranged in parallel. They're connected to each other through these gap junctions and they are very highly branched. Why? Because these cells are not individually controlled. Think about the function of the heart. When the atria contract, do you want to sometimes have a powerful uh, atrial contraction and sometimes 
You want to have a powerful, no. You always want to have powerful atrial contraction because the function of the heart is to move as much blood as possible through it, right? So the heart muscle cells, they're branched, they're shorter, they're striated, they have intercalated discs with these gap junctions so they can rapidly communicate with each other. And they basically will all contract as a unit. And so the atrial myocardium will all contract together and then the ventricular myocardium will contract all together. This is why heart attacks are damaging because they can kill off these myocardial cells. And if you kill off some of the myocardial cells, you don't have as many that are contracting. And that's why the person can become weaker after a heart attack, depending upon how much damage has been done. Because these don't have a very high regeneration capability. Any questions about these two? All right, last muscle tissue is smooth muscle. And smooth muscle is called that because this is the only muscle tissue that doesn't have um, the striations. It does have actin and myosin, but it's not arranged in a sarcomere pattern like it is in cardiac and skeletal muscle. It's involuntary, as I said, the cells are what we call spindle shaped. If you've ever seen a spindle like on a, a staircase, you know, the railing, spindles are usually thicker in the middle and thinner on the ends. And they usually have a centrally located nucleus. They're arranged in sheets. And generally when they contract, all of the smooth muscle cells, again, will contract as a unit in a particular area. This is why when you know I stand up, my blood vessels are gonna constrict a little to raise my blood pressure. And the nice thing about smooth muscle is it doesn't get tired like skeletal muscle and it can stay contracted. It can stay contracted for very long periods of time. Otherwise, if my blood vessels just said, hey, you know, I'm tired now, and you know, they decided to relax, then my blood pressure would drop and I'd pass out on the floor, class would be over, and that'd be it. See, so smooth muscle is kind of cool. And again, it does, it has to do, we'll talk a little bit about it, the mechanism of contraction is a, it's a little bit different because of how actin and myosin are arranged, but it does not have the striations. Any questions there? Alrighty, so the nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is a pretty easy tissue. These first two are pretty easy, I think. The hardest tissue is connective tissue. That one I saved for last. Um, and we will be talking about that, I think, on uh, Tuesday. That's probably where one of the areas we're gonna leave off. Um, so nervous tissue, consists of neurons, two types of cells make up nervous tissue. We have the neuron, which is responsible for sending these signals um, and, and conducting, I guess, signals so that communication can occur with like a muscle or a gland or something like that. Um, and the glial cells are the supporting cells. So the nervous tissue is a good example of how it takes a village, right? To, to help raise something. We're gonna talk in chapter seven about um, the individual types of glial cells and what they do. But basically there are a lot more glial cells than there are neurons. And if it weren't for the glial cells, the neurons would not be able to do what they do. Glial cells definitely support them. They help to, they help to provide nutrition. They help to provide sometimes structure and support, recycle, um, chemical signals, they do lots and lots of things. But the most important thing to remember now, glial cells and neurons are found in nervous tissue. And uh, the neurons, they again are specialized for conducting electrical signals. They have a cell body, which is this part. They have dendrites and then they have an axon. And essentially this direction of signal conduction goes from the dendrites into the cell body and from the cell body out through the axon to some type of you know, muscle or gland, which we call an effector, like we talked about earlier. So this shows us here, again, the direction of uh, information flow through a neuron. Dendrites to cell body to axon. Dendrites are very highly branched. 
off of the cell body and they receive input from other neurons. The cell body is the nucleus, it's the metabolic center, and essentially its job is to figure out what to do with all this information it's getting from all these dendrites. And in chapter seven, we will explain what we mean by it figures out what to do with it. There's a lot to talk about with that. Um, but for now, just know the parts and know the direction of flow of information. Axon is a single long extension that conducts the nerve impulse to other cells. And then as I said, the glial cells are five times more abundant than neurons and they're there to support the neuron. Okay, that's the nervous tissue. Questions? Okay, we're getting there. Four minutes, at least I can give a little introduction into the epithelial tissue for today's lab, then we don't have to do quite as much in, in the lab about this. So, <clears throat> epithelial tissue, where do we find them? They basically are found, if you're looking at a slide, if you find a white space, chances are that that tissue is going to be epithelium because you're gonna find epithelial tissues lining lumens like the digestive tract lumen. The epithelial cells are the ones that come in contact with the food and the material that's passing through the digestive tract. The blood vessels, that's where the blood passes over, are the epithelial cells. Your skin, right? The surface of your skin, the epidermis, is all epithelium, okay? So the first part of, of your skin is all epithelium. So they line and cover body surfaces. I mentioned earlier today, they were also found making up serous membranes like the visceral and parietal pericardium. So there's some other places we see them. They consist of cells that form membranes like serous membranes and glands. They are regularly replaced because they, again, are the first line. I mean, I'm constantly leaving epithelial cells all over the place from my skin. You know, you're leaving your DNA all over the place all the time um, because, uh, you know, there's, it's rough. Epithelial cells are, they can be protective cells and, they, and, and they, they come in contact with everything. They're named for their shape and their arrangement. There are three types of shapes that we pretty much talk about. We have squamous or squamous epithelial cells that are flat. I think they sort of look like fried eggs. A lot of times when I look at them, uh, squamous cells are very, very thin if you look at them on the sides. So they're really great for, you know, you find them in a single layer, they're great for allowing substances to diffuse or, you know, so any structure where you're going to get diffused, like for example, the alveoli of the lungs where oxygen and carbon dioxide can pass through, that's going to be epithelium. That's going to be a squamous epithelium because it's very thin. Columnar epithelial cells are column shaped. They are taller than they are wide. So they look like little columns. And cuboidal. Cuboidal cells are cube shaped. Um, so they're shaped like little squares. Pretty much all sides are about equal like a square. And then two arrangements. There are actually three types, um, but they're two arrangements listed here. The simple membrane is one cell thick. So again, if we had a simple squamous epithelium, right, remember that the arrangement in terms of naming epithelial tissues, arrangement comes before the shape, right? So simple is the arrangement, squamous is the shape. Simple squamous epithelium being very thin, I said, would be in the alveoli right, because it's got diffusion that occurs there. Or like in the capillaries where you get movement of nutrients and waste products, simple squamous. So and in general, all simple membranes, if they're one layer thick, are specialized for transport, uh, like diffusion or absorption. So for example, in the digestive tract in the small intestine, we have simple columnar epithelium, which is nice because it allows for those nutrients to be absorbed directly into the bloodstream because it's only one layer thick. In the kid kidneys, where we get reabsorption of things back into the bloodstream, we have a simple cuboidal epithelium. So again, it's all one layer. You don't have to memorize it. It's, it makes sense, you know, that 
it's easier to pass something through one layer than it is to pass through multiple layers, right? So just think, anytime you see simple uh, membranes that are epithelial, think absorption, reabsorption, diffusion. The thinner it is, the better it is for diffusion. Stratified has a number of layers. So for example, stratified squamous epithelium in your epidermis, many, many layers, and that's specialized for protection. There's one other type of arrangement. Do you guys remember what it was? Pseudo. Mm -hmm. Pseudo stratified, which means it looks like it's layered, but it's not. So it's a false layered appearance. And now I'll get to a really advanced question. Does anybody remember <coughs> where you could find a pseudo stratified epithelium? Here, wait, I'm, I'm gonna give you a hint. Your lungs. <laughs> yes, in, in actually your upper respiratory tract, so like your, your trachea. So your trachea would have pseudo stratified columnar epithelium that has cilia, right? Okay, so this is the last slide, I'll let you go. Um, these are just some pictures showing you uh, what would this, uh, what would, how would you name this epithelium? Arrangement first, is it simple or is it stratified? Yeah, simple squamous epithelium because these are real flat, thin cells in a single layer. What about this epithelium? Well, the sides look pretty even, so. Right, but what was the arrangement? Is it simple? Does this look like this is simple or does this look like this is stratified? Okay, this, it's just right here. So it's simple, you just have one layer of cube-shaped cells. So this is simple cuboidal epithelium. And this over here then, right, simple columnar epithelium. And notice what I told you is true. Anytime you see like an opening or a white space here, that's where you find your epithelium because they always line a lumen. This, of course, is like a, a, you're looking at the surface of it, but if you saw this in cross-section, you would see it's probably in a blood vessel or the alveoli. All right, so that's it for today. Um, quiz, first quiz we'll cover um, through slide 32 there, and uh, I guess take a little break for lunch.